Dr. Roger Nelson is the director of the Global Consciousness Project, an international multi-laboratory collaboration founded in 1997 to study collective consciousness. From 1980 to 2002, he was the coordinator of research at Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory at Princeton University. His professional focus is the study of consciousness and intention and the role of the mind in the physical world. His work integrates science, spirituality, and includes research that is directly focused on numinous communal experiences. Roger, welcome to The Human Experience. An honor to have you here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Human Experience is where it's, where it's really at, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what Put we... Your mouth in God's ears. That's what we try to, to do here anyway. Um, I, I think that the, I've, I've been following the global consciousness dot for, for a while, and I think it's really interesting what you guys are doing. Um, but let's let's start with you know you. Um, how did you how did you get into this? How I mean, where did you how did you decide to to follow you know consciousness and how it affects our lives? Um, I think it's really probably best um, regarded as a kind as a series of what some people call coincidences or and others call synchronicities. I've been lucky to um, to be able to work at, at uh, questions and issues and tasks that I find personally very interesting, which means I've never had to work, hmm. they say. <laughs> yeah. So I started out as a teenager looking for well, books on uh, martial arts, but it was in Nebraska where there were no books on martial arts, but I found one on yoga. And uh, that got me started. It was uh, uh, many years before I really got into the research uh, that I'm now doing. But I have to say, I think there is a kind of a series of meaningful uh, meetings and uh, serendipitous occasions that led me to uh, be engaged in what I personally think is about the most interesting kind of work you can um, imagine. I am a conventionally trained psychologist um, with specializations in uh, sort of neurophysiology and um, perception and that sort of thing, but uh, yeah, I don't want to demean or de denigrate that stuff, but it's no longer interesting to me because I think human consciousness has so much uh, that we don't understand and so much that's important for us to understand that it's nice to be able to work at the edges of what we know. Huh. Very, very interesting. Um, so, I mean, just looking at your your sort of your page, your landing page, the behavior of our network of random sources is correlated with interconnected human consciousness on a global scale. What does this What does this mean? So we have <laughs> we have we have these random event sort of or random number generators sort of all over the planet, and. I mean, how do they how do they work? Well, I can uh, I, I should give you a brief uh, description of how the physical random number generator works. But there, uh, probably the more important thing is um, what it means to have interconnected consciousness. Okay. So we'll start with the uh, the physical devices. They're ba they're electronic and they're based on a quantum process that's called tunneling. Tunneling amounts to electrons passing through barriers that they're not expected to. They're kind of, we, what we do is set up things like diodes and, and transistors, which are switches that allow electrons to flow one direction. We set it up with um, a reverse bias on the, in the current flow. In other words, we set it up so there's pressure against the barrier where the electron should not be able to flow. We're trying to send them backwards through this junction that allows them to go only forward. And what happens is that by some process that's called tunneling, electron tunneling, a few of them wind up on the other side of the barrier hmm. in a fashion that's completely unpredictable. And that provides us with a tiny voltage that we amplify and sample. And when we discover that tiny voltage is a little higher, meaning more electrons penetrated, we call that a one, and if it's lower, we call it a zero, hmm. and that produces ultimately a, 
uh, quite fast uh, relative to how I'm describing it. Uh, that produces a, a, a completely unpredictable sequence of ones and zeros. And we gather those in batches of, in the Global Consciousness Project, we gather them in batches of 200, as if you were throwing coins, 200 at a time, and, and, and counting how many heads there are. So we write down in the computer files the sum of the 200 bits that are gathered every second at each of the nodes all around the world. So you guys are basically flipping okay. a coin on an elemental level, it sounds like. That's right. The coin is being flipped on a completely unpredictable elemental level. Uh, and what computer scientists refer to in, uh, as the, the result of this quantum coin flip is a bit. It's either a one or a zero. And they're every, all the, everything, the whole system is designed so that there will be 50-50 uh, ones and zeros exactly half on average. So there's See, a nice you, distribution. And we try to push that um, distribution in the laboratory experiments. And in the global consciousness experiment, we um, are actually asking the question if just uh, plain uh, consciousness, um, when it's integrated, coherent, uh, when large numbers of people are sharing a, kind, a moment in um, history, a, an emotional e event. So you, you present it. this information with through with a dot, and the dot yes. has different colors. So right. it, and it measures the coherence in. So so people are say that people are thinking or feeling. Does it measure what they're like, how they're feeling, if it? is connected in some way is that is it uh, good question no other i mean in the physical sense there's no connection that anybody can descri describe what we have is a correlation between moments uh, historically important moments where a lot of people are paying attention and changes in the data in the in the network of uh, you know 200 bit samples that we're taking from this random data stream so there's a correlation between emotion on the part of the uh, large numbers of humans in a coherent state sharing um, uh, their reactions. There's a correlation between that and some changes in our data, which happen also to be correlations between these, the behavior of devices that are separated by thousands of, of uh, miles. So you're saying there's some kind of uh, correlation transpersonally almost between the collective intention of all this emotional or whatever consciousness output there is is going to have an effect on this diode. Uh, that's the um, prediction that we make, and that's and the evidence suggests that that is indeed happening. Wow! So if you think about it in, in very personal, very small scale terms, if you meet somebody who is just uh, you might say your soulmate, um, and you have an immediate kind of connection. It doesn't take long before you've got what amounts to a kind of coherent, resonant connection, and we call that love. So people fall in love and they create something new, which is a kind of combination of the two people. And I think what we're seeing in the, in, um, you know, the uh, mass consciousness in the world is something similar to that, but on a grand scale where millions of people are, are uh, participating in a kind of connection. Hmm. It's driven, driven by something from outside, like an emergency or a tragedy or a, a giant celebration. They're driven to um, share in a synchronized way the same kinds of emotions. So it's like we all fall in love with, with each other without knowing it. It's completely unconscious. Wow. So we are sort of all connected is what we this are system is representing. So let's go, let's go back to what the random event generators look like are they just computers or they're little boxes or how does that work yeah they're little boxes that are connected to computers they're um, you know they in the old days i don't know if people still say this it's uh it's smaller than a pack of cigarettes it's so, like, you, uh, so you pretty much have to is it bigger than a bread box <laughs> bigger than a what a bread box is it bigger than a bread box it's not it's nowhere near as big as a bread box unless it's really tiny loaves. So, um, no, it's about uh, two inches. One of them that we use a lot is two inches square and about 
five eighths of an inch thick. It connects through uh, a serial port to a computer that runs special software, custom software that just collects the data that we we're the bits that we were talking about, forms them into trials of 200 bit um, and writes the sum of 200 bits every second to a computer file. And that computer is connected to the internet and every five minutes after it's gathered a, a batch of five minutes worth of data, it sends a, a packet with those data to Princeton where they, it gets recorded in an, or archived on our uh, main you know, server. And the data then from all of the, we call them eggs, by the way. I, it's left over from my son calling this network we're building a kind of electrogiogram, like a EEG for the Earth. But right. It, Gaia, instead of a human, we call it an electrogiogram, and the acronym is EGG. Right. So I may, I may accidentally say egg. <laughs> In, in any case, uh, all the devices report their data um, from wherever in the world, and it's time synchronized. So the same second, the data from the same second are lined up in the archive of data. So we can pull out data um, any time in the history of the project to compare with uh, what's going on in the world. Without without getting too messy on the um the science side of things, how did you guys go about jumping from the conception of this or how you had the, the initial conception of this idea and then breaking it down to actually involve the diodes or is that kind of just a standard for random generation? How, how did this whole process start as far as getting to the point is right now from its conception? Um, if you're talking about the random number generators, um, that's a fairly um, important technology in computer science and um, lots of um, applications are in uh, in uh, cryptography or uh, in you know uh, cryptographic encoding of uh, material so nobody can read it. Uh, so that depends on having true random numbers, random bit string se sequences. Um, it's used um, for a lot of other. I'm getting a feedback from myself. Yeah, the connection's a bit choppy. Um, let's just, we'll move through it and I'll edit out whatever I can or I'll clean it up as much as I can. Okay, so these random number generators are used also in, um, like, if you wanted to test the, um, the uh, test a, a car frame, mm -hmm. uh, this is actually a true application. You you might want you know, you know don't want to put wheels on it and a motor in it and drive it around. What you want to do is uh, put it in a, a shaker that has kind of random shaking. So they use random wow. numbers for all kinds of things like that, and it's used for a lot of purposes in uh, science. And we just use it because uh, we we believe um, we're not we're, at Princeton. We're not the first to do this kind of thing, but. We, it's the industry we, standard, we really so to speak, good. for random generation. Well, you know, we set a standard for engineering approach to it, yeah. <laughs> we, so we, we ask whether people intentionally can change the behavior of a random number generator. Wow. The reason we wanted to use a random number generator was because it is, it's by definition, something whose future isn't known. The future is simply not predictable or not known, and that means it could be changed from what it might have been. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, the, since we're dealing with something subtle, the interaction of human consciousness with physical systems, this seemed like a very good uh, way of um, approaching the problem. So we set up situations where this unpredictable sequence was unrolling in time and asked people to change the uh, expected average from um, to something a little bit different, uh, to higher numbers or lower numbers. So how many how many trials have you guys actually conducted, like with these experiments that you guys are doing? If you're talking about the intention experiments, I guess it would be in the many millions oh. in, in the uh, Global Consciousness Project, which is a little different because it doesn't have somebody trying to change the thing. It just right. has this uh, correlation with big events in the world. Um, there are, I think, now something like 30 gigabytes of data, which is 
200 bits every second for across like 50 or 60 uh, nodes for 15 years. <laughs> I mean, um, how many uh, gigabytes? It's like, you know, I guess we can think of it. It's like uh, 30 billion um, 200 bit trials mm -hmm. at time. So it's 30 billion times 200. Um, that's a lot of uh, trials, you might say. <laughs> So, I mean, Princeton is, it seems like a pretty prestigious place to, to do this stuff at. Um, I guess you were working with uh, the Anomalies Research pair. Um, what, were you, what were you guys doing over there? You guys were doing the remote perception research? We were doing basically three things. The remote perception research, which we referred to some often as precognitive remote perception because we actually set it up so the target that a person was trying to describe wasn't even picked yet. <laughs> uh, but that's a little bit of detail. So remote viewing. And the sec yeah, the remote, it's the same as uh, what people refer to as remote viewing, basically. And we just con focused a lot of attention on doing it precognitively so that... Um, that so did it that work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Surprising. So, so you were able to, so you were able to assign these random kind of people to. How do I even explain this? I, I don't. Uh, were you? Okay. Well, with, I can try to. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. You have um, a volunteer, generally speaking. They're people who are interested, so they're not just completely random people. A volunteer comes in and says, I'd like to try the um, experiment, your re remote perception experiment. And we say, OK, um, y you can um, sit down in this room and um, describe what you envision. It, there's a little bit more lead up to it than that. Relax and just allow yourself to envision where um, this other person and you Somebody, somebody that is known, but we tried both with known partners and not known. So um, you can try to envision where that person is tomorrow at two o'clock p.m. And uh, so just lean back, relax, and describe that. And um, and after you've done that, make some sketches, um, talk into a tape recorder, whatever. Answer this series of thirty um, yes or no questions. And the question would be something like, is it outside? Um, is it uh, uh, dark? Um, are there sh uh, sharp corners? Um, are there uh, people? And, and so on. Hmm. And we use uh, the answers to that, what we call binary descriptor list, to calculate a score against what a random score would be. And it, we've, uh, we're able to show that people produce much better um, descriptions and um, including in this uh, descriptor list than they should be able to by channel. So did you get any uh, kind of feedback from Princeton? Like how did they take to all this stuff? I mean, as far as, like I know coming from well, an academic um, it's arena a, and you hear about all the different. Right, it's, a, it's an interesting um, question and the truth is that there was a, a kind of a variety of um, responses. There were people who thought it was a terrible thing that the university would allow such um, work to be done on the premises and it was blemishing the name and so forth. And there are other people saying, uh, bravo, it's nice to push the envelope. And, uh, it's, uh, and I regarded Princeton University as being, you know, a place where academic freedom and um, you know, a kind of uh, respect for the integrity of people who are doing research and so forth, um, that that was um, a, a prominent part of the place. And it was. I mean, we, we, had, we had to fend off some attack from, from uh, critics and naysayers, but um, the, the guy who actually set this up and, uh, gets a tremendous amount of credit for putting what I personally think was way too much of his valuable time into... Uh, defending against those kinds of attacks. So, in other words, we it, it was there was some of each, and I I, w I would like to add one uh, note to that. It turns out that the um, the higher the uh, the level of um, 
standing, you might say, people like Nobel Prize winners were likely to come in and say, that's pretty interesting, um, tell us more. Whereas uh, kind of run-of-the-mill guys that are trying to beef up their, um, you know, uh, resume. There is, there is a guy uh, named uh, Milton Rothman. He wrote, he wrote an article in the Skeptical Inquirer, and he said that the pair, the pair Institute was an, considered an embarrassment to science. I mean, that's I, I can't I couldn't believe that he said that, but it is. I mean, I guess it is the Skeptical Inquirer. So, well, Doctor Nelson, this is the, the the this goes to an interesting point. Is you've seen this firsthand? Is where you have the old school materialist sciences butting heads with the emerging information that's coming out of quantum physics that says that there's you know likely more to reality on a on a hyper dimensional level. And how do you see this kind of amalgamation of the hard and now it seems like almost spiritual aspects to quantum physics now that they're going to converge, you know, with the data that you guys have even put forth? Um, I think there is a um, there's a clear movement in the direction of integrating across uh, disciplines and across territories that used to be forbidden. Uh, in other words, there are more people now, um, and the bright ones, the really good ones, are the ones that are, you know, leading the pack anyway. They're the ones that are opening up, um, mm-hmm. or I think, than the pedestrian people who are, I don't want to be uh, mean, <laughs> but the, 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 the truth is that uh, the, the, the people with really creative imagination can see first that it, we're not destroying science and we're, it's not an embarrassment <laughs> Uh, to any institution to allow uh, creative, well done scientific uh, research in an area that hasn't been done before right. very well. It, uh, it's not an embarrassment. Instead, it's a credit to an institution. And I think, you know, honestly, I think probably more uh, uh, people are looking at it that way now. And people like, what was his name, Rothman? Uh, uh, Milton. Right, yeah. And, Milton Rothman. Yeah, I, I don't know him or or his work, but it's. Uh, I think he's talking about his own feelings, not about uh, a, a fact in the in within a great institution like uh, Princeton University. So, so just there were to, some people that way. I mean, it did receive a lot of criticism. It like it is called pseudoscience. I mean, I, I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, like criticizing it but yeah. there was you know there was a lot of criticism that was going towards the the pair is that why it closed is that why you moved over to the the gcp or no no i retired in 2002 but i had started uh, the gcp in 1997 so and i like doing it so i kept on doing that my wife says you're not retired <laughs> hmm. because there's a fair amount of uh, interest in the, in this material but um, yeah, there, there was there there has been, and if you look in certain places like Skeptical Inquirer, you're going to find nothing but negativity. Right. And if you look at uh, Wikipedia entries on anything related <laughs> to uh, anomalies research, parapsychology, psychic research, uh, near death experiences, any of that stuff that's at the edge, they there is a dedicated cadre of editors, so called. Who um, who know it's all who who dedicate their um, lives and their apparently considerable amount of free time to trashing anything that gets written about people or projects in these uh, what they think of as fringe areas. I think um, we'll see, and you know, in another five or ten years, or maybe it'll be fifty years, but we'll see um, that and some kind of noticeable gets, shift. You know, it's, Sorry? Some kind of a noticeable shift is What's, definitely occurring, it seems. I think so. It, but it's, it's real slow. When you have people with um, a very strong commitment to a point of view, it's really hard to change them. It's, it's, uh, there are aphorisms about that. Hmm. Dr. Nelson, I, ha- I have to ask you, um, you know, another, another uh, researcher out in Cambridge, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, and his work with morphic resonance concepts. Have you guys collaborated at all with the Global Consciousness Project, or well, how does how do you feel that if you are familiar with his works, I um, am. Yeah, how does this fit into yeah. the bigger picture? Because it seems like these are almost the 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 
the, um, this melting pot of the two ideas is just <laughs> astounding. Rupert is a friend of mine, so you have to take that into consideration. Um, but I, I have, uh, I, I really, I think he's one of the most creative and productive um, and uh, um, scientists, researchers um, on the planet. Now he gets a lot of criticism too, but he doesn't uh, back off from what he thinks is a, is the right way to go. And um, no, we haven't done what you what's normally called collaboration, but we talk about. Um, and this, the kinds of things that interest us both, and there's a tremendous amount of parallel. I, uh, a long time ago, I, I said, Rupert, I, th I kind of think we need something like morphic resonance to explain this what interconnection that's happening at an unconscious level among humans. And, and he said, um, well, I'm not sure I see a biological imperative. He's there. <laughs> so, which I thought was an absolutely cool answer. But I suspect he might say, well, maybe there's, uh, maybe we're beginning to see a biological imperative because I think uh, at some level we have to recognize that what's happening on this planet is being pushed uh, in certain directions by human beings, um, whether the climate deniers wish to believe it or not, we have a tremendous influence, and, and not of it, I'm, I have to say, um, um, a great part of it is destructive. And so we really need, um, we have a biological imperative. If we want to survive and have any elephants left on the planet, um, in, um, you know, in the, in the near future, we're, we have to come to a kind of, you know, an ability to respect each other and collaborate rather than um, try to steal everybody's stuff. Well, even from like a developmental or, you know, inheritance type of aspect, you, you see books like the 99th or the 100th Monkey and these different effects that are being happened that are that are occurring on non-physical realities, it seems like. And there seems to be some kind of a, uh, of purpose for this linkage on perhaps an unconscious level in the logo, so to speak. And if we're seeing it in these biological model models with these these monkeys that were transferring skills from different islands after a certain amount of resonant monkey <laughs> yeah <clears throat> i um yeah I, I hate to say this but there's there that's been criticized too that research nevertheless it's a ter terrific metaphor and it may be true and the uh, the but the more basic truth that you you speak is that um I, there is a, a change in what's happening on this planet Talk about some of the parapsychological exercises that you guys were conducting. I think that would be interesting, um, like that, telekinesis and like kind of changing stuff with your mind, which which sounds intriguing to me. Yeah. Um, you, do you have a specific question, or you just want me to go? I I would just would like to know like what you guys were doing over at you know Pear. I guess it was we. That was part of Pear, Pear's research, right? Yes. The, part, the first um, major experiment was we, when we call it an REG experiment. It's insane. It uses the random number generator. Um, we called it random event generator. It, uh, basically, the experiment for an individual was to sit down with the machine on the table, no wires or other, any other kind of connections, Mm -hmm. And watch numbers come up, and uh, which were numbers that were sums of 200 bits. Uh, in other words, numbers like 100, 107, 94, uh, 101, and so forth, <clears throat> with an instruction to try to get more high numbers in one condition or more low numbers in a different condition. And then in a third condition, is to let the machine do what it does normally. <clears throat> we call that high, low, and baseline. And... Um, over years and years, probably I think 12 years um, was the last summary paper. <clears throat> we found, uh, and we you know gathered strong evidence um, in statistical terms that while it was not a large effect, um, people could do this, and in a completely highly controlled um, uh, in experiment and environment. So. In other words, the intentions that people had registered somehow in the data produced by these random number devices. Wow. There was a connection between the mind and the material, the mind and the machine. 
And, it, and like I said, it's, it was a, a small effect, so small that I, I like to make sure people know that we don't expect it anytime soon to be using it for changing your television channels <laughs> or opening your garage doors. Yeah. But, uh, yeah can you, can you go into a little more about what, what you guys would consider just statistically significant as far as just like a certain p-value or what, what, what was the actual like bio stats behind it? Well, uh, there is a kind of um, widely accepted so-called statistical significant p-value, which is 0 0.05, in other words, 5 and 20. But our experiment was designed to learn more by doing more. So we uh, aggregated uh, many dozens and ultimately hundreds of replications of a basic experiment. Some of them would have a significant deviation, some of them would not, some would go backwards. But the bottom line was an accumulation at uh, something on the order, depending on which subset you're looking at, anywhere from three or four sigma, meaning probabilities like one in 10,000, up to uh, 10 to the minus uh, 10, which is um, billion, one in the billion probability that would be happening by chance. So in other words, not really trying to, um, you know, claim, claim significance on the basis of one experiment, but on a long series of repetitions of the same experiment with modifications to learn more about things like distance, whether pe if people were doing it remotely or in the same room with the machine, uh, gender, whether women do it better than men, um, groups, whether two could do it better than one, and a, a lot of other questions like that some physical, some psychological. It turns out that the physical things don't matter much, but the psychological things do. And, um, you know, so I'm, and, and it's a long, a longer answer uh, to the question, what, how did we decide on significance? It's basically, we're trying to learn something rather than uh, just prove something. We you know, wanted to, yeah, yeah, go ahead. There was, there was an article that while I was doing the research for this conversation um, that I found, uh, it was conducted uh, through Washington State University where they had, they had two people sitting in different rooms. One of them was wearing like a sort of helmet with wires in it and uh, the other person was using a remote control to play a video game. One person, the other person in the other room was watching the video game take place. And the other person was in the other room with watching nothing and just had the kind of controller. And so the two people, the, the person watching the game was supposed to send the other person a sort of mental intention thought of what to do next in the game. And it, it kind of proved it kind of proved that there was this sort of morphogenic field connection, yeah. some some sort of something that was happening between these two people. Yeah, I'm. Um, I, I think those experiments are brilliant. There's, uh, there's several different um, uh, investigations have been done of that kind of thing, and what it amounts to is uh, is remote correlation of brain activity and um, it it's been demonstrated in I'd say something like a half a dozen different laboratories it's quite remarkable and it's a um, you know it's one of the many uh, other pieces of evidence that that human consciousness does not live inside the skull it lives in the world in a larger world hmm. it's like a receiver for some kind of transmission well um, some people would say it's um, I mean, that's a, a model that, you know, it's it's um, a sort of nice description, but it probably isn't what's really happening. Probably like, for example, um, some of the more recent uh, sophisticated modeling has, is based on something a little bit like quantum entanglement, where basically there's no separation in the first place of, uh, of the of the minds that are involved in a, an experiment like that. So what they're doing is always correlated in some sense, um, but um, the experimental situation is designed to let us see uh, the correlation. It's designed, in a sense, to amplify a certain aspect of the correlation so it becomes visible. That's what we do in the Global Consciousness Project, too. 
I think people, human beings, are all over the world are always interacting uh, at some very deep uh, level. It's quite profound, but there's basically very little synchronization of that most of the time, and consequently, it's not visible. Doesn't have much any of any um, effect. But if we all are, uh, you know, listening to the terrible news of 9/11, or if we're all waiting for midnight, five minutes away, to lift the glass or uh, grab our honey and give a, a hug, you know, that uh, that is a um, that's an, a powerful synchronizer. These kinds of events, celebrations, and things that people share. Is what there? Is, yeah. What is considered? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Doctor Chief. What What is considered the significant event? You know, I know that um, McKenna talked about having the time wave zero, and he was basing it off the I Ching, and he was basing it off novelty. But what is what is novelty? What is this significant event? Like, what is the barometer for the specific, or what is the what is what is going to be what is a significant event? Are you asking how do I choose, or how does the global consciousness? choose an event to analyze yeah and is there almost like a severity to an event perhaps on the significance of it does that get demonstrated within the models sometimes there's um two or th there's proud there's about a half a dozen criteria but the most important ones are that a very large number of people be involved be engaged by whatever the event is and it uh, it can be either a positive kind of event uh, like new year's or um the Kumbh Mela in India, where 20 million people come to bathe in the Ganges all at once. Um, or it can be a, a tragedy like the um, bombing of uh, just a few days ago in uh, Nigeria. A um, suicide bomber blew himself up with, in a class, in a, um, you know, a, an assembly hall with... Um, hundreds of uh, kids around and it killed maybe 50 or 60 of the kids and, and damaged more. That kind of um, event may not be known to huge numbers of people in the world, but it becomes known by way of, you know, our media. The internet, right. Yeah, and the internet. And um, I think it, it, it causes, it brings a whole lot of people into a feeling of something like compassion for, and sadness and maybe anger but it, there's a lot of shared emotion. So lots of people, if there's millions of people involved, I think we're likely to, it's, it's something we're likely to consider to be a global event. And we'll set a formal prediction for that event and then do the analysis later when the data have come in. Does um, it usually precede or is it at the same time or is it after the fact sometimes? Uh, well, for um, things like bombings, we don't, we can't make any prediction about. It. We don't know anything about it until it happens, and so the uh, the event is identified and set after the event occurred. But the analysis is done. That is, the data are examined only after that um, hypothesis test has been registered in our, you know, our, our, in a what we call a hypothesis regis registry. Is there is there a sort of trend that you guys have have noticed at the the GCP? Is there more coherence than normal, or is it getting worse? Or um, it, you know, it's a it's a I, I love the question. I mean, I don't have a very good answer for it, but I I can tell you a couple of things that we know from the data. Um, one is that there are long-term trends in the data without regard to, their, to any events. And, and I don't know whether this is a fair characterization, but it could be that something about the way the world is uh, corresponds or maybe or correlates with long-term trends in a positive direction or a negative direction. For example, we started in 1997 and there were um, yeah, two or three, 1998, I'm sorry, uh, and really not until uh, the beginning of 1999 with a stable network. Mm -hmm. So there was a, and uh, one of my colleagues did a, a comparison or a kind of correlation between presidential approval ratings and the long-term trends in the GCP data. So it was kind of flat and wandering in a random way for a couple of years, and then around um, 2001, uh, sort of late 2001, 
um, it started a downward trend that continued for, I think, um, pretty close to eight years, seven or eight years. And then it did a, a reverse um, and started an upward trend. And by the way, that downward trend is it's not so easy to, I, to, to do this kind of analysis, but can be done. It, was a, it had a significant slope. It was significantly persistent and uh, steep. That mm -hmm. was the trend. So, um, and then in, um, in these, so these, uh, there may have been things in the world that correspond to that. And the to, and, uh, presidential approval rating happened to be corresponding. That long <laughs> downward trend was during one presidential uh, two terms. <laughs> and then um, the upswing was in the first part of, uh, well, might as well name names, Obama's uh, presidency. But I'm not saying that we should attribute it there because another person did a similar kind of analysis and found that the uh, DOL, the dollar index, mm -hmm. uh, is a, a measure of how the dollar is, uh, you know, monetarily ranked against other currencies. Right. That has uh, trends which correspond very nicely also to uh, the Global Consciousness Project trends. So take your pick and there wow. could be you know there could be a dozen other thing or maybe combinations of many things that could um, that could be found to correlate and might actually have something to do with it I, I wouldn't be I guess quite so interested in this work if I weren't willing to speculate <laughs> that there is such a thing as a global consciousness you know something that we don't we have no way of uh, communicating with or or even perceiving, but we might be able to see some effects of it. And if um, if there were such a thing, I think it might delight in uh, in um, you know like baffling, baffling us <laughs> with trends that we don't understand. <laughs> you know, like oh, and then another way to think of that is maybe it lives like the rest of us, um, like all of us do in uh, changing environments and changing attitudes and moods and so forth. So it might uh, feel real good sometimes and not so great sometimes. What do, what do you feel is going to happen, though, in the near future when, it, let's say, the data from the Glo the Global Consciousness Project comes out and it's it's even satisfying just from a pure numbers, like the validity is there on a scientific basis. Quantum physics continues, basically showcases that there is some kind of transpersonal morphic resonant field. What do you anticipate happening uh, in the future? As far as um, just well, this information lot, yeah. becoming commonplace. Yeah, I, I wish I could say <laughs> I think it uh, will. That's something uh, really positive will uh, will happen in my lifetime. I'm, but I'm pretty old, so you guys are hopefully very young, and you will see some very you will see some gathering of intelligence on the planet. My um, notion when I started this project 15 years ago was that. There is, there should be something like Teilhard de Chardin's uh, uh, notion of a noosphere, uh, which is a, a sheath of intelligence for the Earth. We very desperately need a, uh, a kind of protective shell or surround of intelligence for this planet because we're, we're hurting it as, as it is. We need to govern ourselves and we need uh, to collaborate and I, and uh, coalesce as a kind of intelligence uh, for the Earth, which is what um, Tehar said um, poetically, but uh, also persuasively, I think, is the destiny of, of human of evolution. You know, we've gone you know, from um, single cells to complicated um, you know, insects and birds and uh, animals to humans that think. And uh, he said that while we imagine sometimes we're the pinnacle of evolution, there is another stage that's easy to envision, and that of combination of humans into a, a larger scale um, um, working entity that, that, um, that really does m kind of um, manage things uh, so that we ha we have a safe and beautiful uh, productive home on this planet hmm. wow very interesting can we 
can we just talk about White Hawk Eco Village? Because I just want a piece <laughs> of land there. It seems like a pretty cool place. Um, is this something that you started? Uh, just a bunch of people kind of living together, or how well, does that go? It was actually started by uh, not by me, but um, I guess I could say that my son uh, Greg was one of the people who started. He um, and another he he he, wor he worked together with several other people um some there's a guy who owned the land had inherited a farm 120 acres and uh rather than have it having it built into a shopping center he wanted to build uh something like an eco village and uh got together with others and greg my son was one of them and so um, they proceeded to build, um, begin an eco village that's called White Hawk, and um, I don't know uh, how you came across it, but I am <laughs> actually building a house there too. <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, um, I was digging into the research, and I saw that you were affiliated with it, or I wasn't sure. And uh, looks like a really cool place to kind of be. So, other than having a really cool beard and probably one of the coolest jobs on the planet, uh, Dr. Nelson, I think you're a pretty interesting character. You have a really, really cool story, and I know, I know that you're, 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 you, in your words, you're old. But um, I mean, we, yeah. I mean, I think I definitely think that this work it has a long way to go and. We, I mean, this, and we're just kind of touching it, and I, I think it's apparent from all the critics and the naysayers and and people who kind of you know like talk badly about what's going on. I, I think that you know after some time it, it'll become self apparent that we are connected, that we do experience things on a a global scale. Um, so that, that's kind of what we're trying to do here at the Human Experience. We're trying to bring awareness to that. So there's like a birthing point. process going on right now, it oh, seems. Oh, uh, on oh. I really think that's that's right. That's a beautiful metaphor for what's happening because because, you know, there there's always something new uh, coming on. Anybody um, who believes that we've reached the uh, the end of the trail uh, is is just wrong. And and I, I think I'd like to also say people that don't actually know what they're talking about typically are wrong. You know, a whole lot of the people who, uh, ha, uh, who are critical of research like happens in professional parapsychology don't do their homework. And it's, it's kind of a sad thing that they nevertheless wind up um, being listened to <laughs> by uh, people I, at, like the editors at Wikipedia. But I don't want to complain about that. I'd rather just get on with the business of um, learning as much as we can while we're able to, uh, you know, keep on doing these kinds of experiments. I think we are, it's a gift that we are able in, uh, in this day and age, and this is, by the way, only possible in the last two or three decades, uh, to do something like the Global Consciousness Project that required the Internet. And you guys may be too young to uh, even know when the net internet starts. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that young. No, it's, it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Um, but I had the uh, the privilege of watching this. Uh, speaking of birth, I watched the internet be born. I was at Princeton University, which was one of the original ARPA nodes, and a whole lot of that was going on. I watched the first connections between Firestone Library and the com uh, what was called the Computer Center happening. You know, it's like, now I can go to the library and log into my um, uh, my accounts at the Computer Center and uh, uh, crank up the APL and do some analysis. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, uh, that was like in the late 80s and, uh, and uh, early 90s. But anyway, it's, it, it's really... Um, uh, the, um, the, we talk about exponential growth. There is no telling what will be what it will look like in even five years. You know, how long ago did um, the iPhone uh, uh, take storm the, the planet? You know. Yeah. yeah. Now there are places in Africa which where there is no internet connection, but you can you can uh, connect anyway because you've got a phone. <laughs> It's really it's amazing. Just complexity upon complexity, it seems. Yeah. 
It's beautiful. So we have, uh, I think you said it very well, we've got a long way to go. There's a tremendous amount to learn. We scratch the surface and, and hope to, uh, I guess one of the things I personally, uh, li um, you know, one of the things I try to do is um, present a, enough material to interest some other people in uh, doing the same kind of work. And, and there are, there are people all, all, all around. I'm also very much interested in fostering as much as I can the kind of interconnection of interconnections. You guys are a group. I don't know how many people are in that are already you know connected to the human XP, mm -hmm. effect, but it's probably a large number. On the other hand, there are, are a bunch of other organizations that you've never heard of who also have a large number of people who are doing that who are working in the, in the same you know, um, fields, plowing the same fields, planting the same seeds, and, and nurturing the growth. So We're just waiting for that convergence on us. Yeah. I, one of my pet notions is, and it seems I'm too uh, out straight to do this myself, is to um, find um, a little, you know, somehow foster a group whose mission is to connect all the groups, <laughs> you know, provide information to everybody about everybody else. That's a that's a very important role, though. You know, if you look through different types of uh, the more hermetic, the more hermetic aspects of society from previous ages, and they talk about different archetypes, and there's there's something to be said for that that archetype or that 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 pinpoint linchpin connector that gets all these different pieces together. You know, right. you know, the, so. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not exactly. I wish I had enough you know, time and energy uh, to do more with it. But I, <laughs> the, the GCP, I have a, uh, I get a lot of incoming from people, um, you know, like you and people like the Circle of Life in Italy and the, um, in the, uh, the Hungarian. Uh, group doing the same kind of things there's just there there we're, we, we are all over the place and um, uh, pretty soon i think this will happen within i i think within a few years uh, there will be just a kind of uh, coalescence a tremendous growth toward each other where people are no longer um thinking only in terms of what i'm doing and how I want to be first, or I'm, I, I think my por my project is very important to realizing that I don't need to be first. I just need to be there and, and uh, connect with the other folks who are on the same path. Do Dr. Nelson, can I give you an idea for one of these first conversions? Last week we had, um, two weeks ago, our last guest, we had Tom Schroeder, and he was working with uh, Rick Doblin from the MAPS Institute, and they seem to be going kind of on this fringe not fringe, but they, you know, they're going on, on from the psychedelic standpoint, exploring that kind of realm. And do you think that's a convergence that perhaps the Global Consciousness Project and people studying perhaps psychedelics and getting people to actually – getting scientists almost to perhaps use substances to explore these spaces and these ideas in a, in a scientific manner? Do, do I think that's possible or desirable? Yes. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> There, there, there's a, a long and honorable history, in spite of what some of the historians say, to that. You know, people like Terence, um, Terence McKenna, McKenna, and um, Baba Ramdas, and and you know, bless their souls, all kinds of hippies. <laughs> uh, they they started uh, making connections that other people weren't doing. And I think it was partly driven by some of the you know the psychedelic experiences so dr uh, nelson last one last question and and we'll wrap this up but um have you other than this project i know that you're kind of strictly a scientist and you, and you like the order and things but have you personally experienced anything spiritual or like an out-of-body experience or anything like that have you had anything like that happen to you oh never no, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, come I, on, I, he's a Princeton guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm. Uh, I, I have. Uh, I I mentioned this um, series of meaningful coincidences. I actually have a, um, a chapter in a book that I am uh, writing, and it's called "Design by Coincidence." 
uh, what I mean by that is that lots of what happens in my life, and I think it may be more true of others than they um, are able to see, is um, a, a lot of what happens is driven by really what, uh, what from another perspective should be called chance. But when you have one after another after another, uh, chance uh, occurrences that, uh, you know, co come together in such a way that it's unavoidable that you make a certain decision or go in a certain direction, then there's something um, in spiritual about that, I think. And I've, per I've experienced a tremendous amount of that. Hmm. I am what I am and I am where I am exactly because of that. And it's a profound um, understanding that I have uh, within my personal history. You know, I've had all kinds of little, littler incidents too, like uh, driving down a snowy road and hearing on the radio um, a song that was telling me, she's all right, and there's no problem. Um, and it looked like there was difficulty, but it's overcome, it, it's all right. And then finding out later that a friend of mine had um, skidded off the road into the ditch, didn't get hurt. And, and so forth. I mean, the song was telling me, just don't, don't uh, worry. <laughs> and it, that sounds kind of mundane, but it's not mundane when you experience it. Yeah, yeah. Dr. G, you have any questions to wrap this up or what's yeah, up? Yeah, uh, is there, is there, what's going on next for the Global Consciousness Project? Or is there anything else we can look forward to or any, uh, perhaps like a site we can direct our uh, listeners to? Well, the... Uh, the Shameless plugging? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the site that people should use is um, http colon slash slash global dash mind dot org. Um, there are other um, addresses that will get you there, but most of them wind up going to the primary server, which is on a slow, a low bandwidth connection. And so people get disappointed and um, and also they overload my, my, uh, the primary server. So uh, globalmind-org, uh, global-mind.org. <laughs> <laughs> or they can just Google uh, Global Consciousness Project and they will land on your page. Is that right? They will land on my page, but probably the, uh, the primary server, the slow one. Oh, okay. Shout, shout out but, um, to our listeners who shut down our server, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we had just a quick anecdote here before we close off. We had our last interview. Uh, I got I got a an email notice that the server was overloaded because seventy thousand people were clicking our our podcast oh link, and so uh, so thanks guys for for you know putting me in that situation it's it's definitely one of those it's a good problem so um dr nelson it, it's is really you're a really cool guy man i i definitely want to buy you a beer or whatever it is you're you're drinking on these days uh okay. <laughs> but um thank Come you so, <laughs> yeah i think that would be really cool um thank Get you for, some locally brewed beer <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for lending us uh you know your time and and your knowledge and very very cool to have you on here Really enjoyed well, that. that. Yeah, thank you. It's a very great pleasure to talk with you guys for a number of reasons. One, you you are prepared. You actually paid attention to you know what the questions might be. <laughs> and number two, you are obviously in the business of bringing people together and and uh, informing people about, in a sense, who we are. There is a lot to be known that, uh, uh, and we need people like you to. Uh, you know, spread the words, spread the um, the actually beautiful understanding of what I what it means to be human. Well, I mean, that actually that means a lot. I was I, I don't want to belabor everything, but um, that reminded me of a Terrence McKenna uh, podcast I was listening to recently, where he talks about you need civilization needs scouts, and ah. every every generation, the civilization and the status quo, they they come against these scouts who are supposed to look over the horizon not not to say that we're scouts but there there seems to be a role for this specific type of what you're doing in your field and what other people are doing in their fields and you know this isn't this is an important task at hand and just because the the, the general population doesn't see it that way we got to this point because of it so uh for sure terence mckenna was a scout 
and so are you guys. <laughs> so thank you very much I'll, for your work. I'll definitely take that compliment any day. Um, thank you so much. This is this has been the human experience. I'm Xavier and Dr. G. Thank you, thank you so much, guys, for listening, and we will catch you guys next time.